Today, my pieces will all be based on the theme of struggling. In the past year, I think we've all struggled a bit more than usual. Whether that struggle may have resulted from dealing with COVID-19, losing a loved one, schoolwork and self-isolation. And we all deal with these struggles in different ways. For example, my grandma has knitted every piece of wool in Somerset and my mum has turned to extreme retail therapy. My point is, we may all have our different struggles, our different ways of coping with them, but we should be there for one another. And with that, my first piece is from a play called A Girl in a School Uniform Walks Into a Bar by Lulu Raxa. It is a future and there are blackouts and no one knows what is causing them. Schoolgirl Steph desperately tries to escape a blackout when she ends up in a bar where she meets my character Belle. They both discuss their coping mechanisms. wandered into one of those safety videos. <laughs> it's a time for you to get up and give a big smile. It'll all be okay, just sit and count until it's over. <laughs> well, aren't you doing well? If you get to a million, I'll buy you a chocolate bar. You know what? I bet I could get people who pay to watch this. Whenever I see weird stuff like this, I always think, God, I bet there's a market for it. See, I find this so funny, right? Because this whole time I've been strolling into my bar, acts like it's the most normal thing in the world. And now look at you. Anyway, uh, don't worry, this place has got great locks. Why do you think I'm always here? You know what scares me though? Showering, because like, when you're in the shower, you can't actually hear anything outside of the shower. So I'm just in there freaking out. And I do this thing, like there's a wasp, and I stand really still, really, really still and then I think you know they won't get you now this is stupid for a number of reasons firstly being that if there was someone in the house standing still would not make me invisible secondly this they is already in the house you know this woman I knew got killed in the bath in the shower yeah, someone used to come to the bar, she just got right home, put away things, it was a blackout, so she just got right home, and she gets in the shower, and of course it's not like the shower would even work, but she was probably thinking, this will calm you down, you know, the routine, the motion, the association, and she gets out and, I'm sorry, I just thought we were sharing. Look, we all have our coping mechanisms. Yours is state sanctioned counting, and mine happens to be listing the various ways which I might die. Wonder which is healthier. But, but maybe we should talk about it. You know, this other one I know got killed in the bath. Although Steph finds comfort in counting, I'm not sure counting the days we've been in lockdown is the most positive way to get through this. My next piece is a poem called A Court of Validation by Daniel Ospina. This poem talks about the ongoing need for validation, which is something I think we can all relate to. Settle down, the court is in session, the esteemed court of validation, where I stand trial for being and thus must attend this hearing, to seek the sublime opinions of the wise jury of champions who've been there, done that. Please lecture me on how to act. Tell me how I must dress, what to say under duress, 
to brandish my success and my right the test, to be finally accepted among civilization. The stamp of approval from the court of validation. Oh, here comes a verdict for the judge to read. I'm guilty of possessing an identity. Therefore, I'm sentenced to a lifetime of conformity to the status quo established by society. Oh, but your honor, there must be some mistake. There has to be another path to take. Sorry, child, this is the only way or else you'll be imprisoned in the cell of dismay. Embrace your fate without hesitation. Indeed, it's a gift from the court of validation. Insecurities often get the best of us, and you can have a real fight on your hands trying to batter the voices telling you that you're not good enough. My next piece is from the book We Were Lies by E. Lockhart, which follows my character, Cadence Sinclair. Cadence knows both sides of having that validation and wanting that validation. Welcome to the beautiful Sinclair family. No one is a criminal, no one is an addict, no one is a failure. The Sinclairs are athletic, tall and handsome. We are old money Democrats. Our smiles are wide, our chins square, our tennis serves aggressive. It doesn't matter if divorce shreds the muscles of our hearts so that they will hardly beat without a struggle. We're Sinclairs. No one is needy, no one is wrong. We live, at least in the summertime, on a private island off the coast of Massachusetts. Perhaps that is all you need to know. My full name is Caden Sinclair Eastman. I live in Burlington, Vermont with mommy and the three dogs. I used to be strong, but now I am weak. I used to be pretty, but now I look sick. It is true I suffer migraines, it's my accident. It is true I do not suffer full. I like a twisted meaning, you see, uh, suffer migraines, do not suffer fools. The word means almost the same as it did in the previous sentence, but not quite. Suffer. You could say that it means endure, but that's not exactly right. My story starts before the accident. The summer I was 15, dad ran off with someone he loved more than us. Dad was a middling successful professor of military history. Back then, I adored him. He wore tweed jackets, he was gaunt, he drank monkey tea, he was, uh, he was fond of board games and let me win. That June, summer 15, Dad announced he was leaving and departed two days later. He told my mother that he was not Sinclair and couldn't try to be one any longer, couldn't smile, couldn't lie, couldn't be a part of that beautiful family and those beautiful houses. Couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't. My father packed the last suitcase into the back of the Mercedes and started the engine. And then he took out a handgun and shot me in the chest. I was standing on the lawn and I fell. The bullet hole opened wide and my heart was out of my ribcage and onto a flower bed. Blood gushed rhythmically from my open wound and from my eyes, my ears, my mouth. It tasted like, like salt and failure. The bright red shame of being unloved soaked the grass in front of our house. Mommy snapped. She said, to get a hold of myself, be normal now, she said, right now, she said because you are, because you can be. Don't cause a scene, she told me, breathe and sit up. I did what she asked. She was all I had left. Mommy and I tilted our square chins high as dad drove down the hill. Then we went indoors and trashed the gifts he'd given us. Jewelry, clothes, books, anything. In the days that followed, we got rid of the couch and the armchairs my parents bought together, tossed the wedding china, the silver, the photographs, purchased new furniture, hired a decorator, 
placed an order with Tiffany's silverware, spent a day walking through art galleries to cover up the empty spaces in our walls. Just as my pieces have explored today, it is evident that we've always come up against something. Maybe counting helps, maybe taking one day at a time helps, knitting, shopping, making a chocolate cake and eating it all in one go helps, but you have to do what you have to do. Maybe the best way is to be understanding that though we may go through similar things, we all have our different ways of dealing with them. Thank you for listening.